Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. I've had to very quickly learn where my boundaries are in terms of what I do feel comfortable in doing and what I don't feel comfortable in doing, and having the confidence to say no. Welcome, listeners, to another episode of In the Envelope, and welcome to awards season. Fully, officially, finally underway, this long-extended, pandemic-affected award season is in full swing this week with uh, Wednesday's Golden Globe nominations and, most importantly, for purposes of Backstage and this podcast, the SAG Award nominations, which are announced Thursday. So what are we thinking? What what does everybody think? Um, The Globe nominations, of course, as usual, everyone, they're, they're kooky. They're fun. They have a musical comedy film category. They are, you know, selected by a group of 90 to 100 journalists from around the world, and they are just a fun time. That ceremony is happening February 28th. I'm like giving myself a pop quiz as awards editor here. Tina Fey and Amy Poehler are returning to host. It's just fun. It's just another iron in the fire of film award season. There are TV nominations as well, of course. But SAG award nominations, here's the thing. Here's the thing about both Globe and SAG. Uh, I would say a huge takeaway, if you don't know much about either of these, you want my take. This is, as we suspected, Netflix's year. Netflix, as usual, in recent years, they have dominated the nominations tally because they have so many contenders in both the TV races and the film races. So for SAG and for Globe, which both recognize acting talent, behind-the-camera talent in the case of the Globes, It's Netflix. Netflix has done very well. Which brings us to today's podcast guest. Congratulations to Emma Corrin for her Golden Globe and her SAG nominations. We will be linking in today's episode description and the article that goes with today's episode on Backstage.com to our write-up of the SAG nominations. It's like uh, the biggest day of the year for me, at least at Backstage. And um, we are also linking to all of Backstage's coverage of The Crown, which is, of course, the show that Emma Corrin, ha- you know, appeared on in the fourth season. It all dropped at once. And Emma Corrin joining the cast as none other than Princess Diana, she basically became an overnight sensation. I mean, it doesn't get more overnight than appearing on a new season of The Crown, where all 10 episodes, they all drop at once and everybody tunes in and everybody has is watching it and has something to say about it, as we're seeing from these, you know, many nominations for the show. Backstage, of course, has also covered the show a lot. There's just a lot to dig into with The Crown. It's so unique. There's a new cast every two years. How do you how do you cast the royal family, many of whom are still alive and in the public eye today? Um, it's a period piece. It's it's a gorgeously scripted show. You got to get the you know you got to get the sets and the design and the costumes exactly right. But these actors are not serving imitations. What I got the most out of this interview with Emma, for those of you who watch The Crown and have read every interview about The Crown, do stay tuned for this whole interview because Emma had amazing things to say. In particular, about the idea of like not taking on Princess Diana from like an imitation, or let's start with the wig and the iconic dresses and figure out who that character is from there. She got the most out of learning who Diana was in her own words, not through biographies or paparazzi. She got the most out of discovering through herself and through the scripts her way of playing the role. And she said this thing about the wig and the costuming and all of that being kind of the final element that zips up the portrayal. 
the the crown and of course this this role in particular they just serve as such a cool way to talk about the acting process especially for a relative newcomer like Emma we love talking to the veterans we love talking to the Natalie Portman's and Julia Louis Dreyfus's on this podcast but I do know having worked at backstage for so long it's the breakout stars it's the newcomers like Emma that our listeners and our readers get the most out of. So do stay tuned for this whole interview. Um, And I recommend any of the interviews that Christine McKenna Torella in her uh, post-interview segment today, she shouts out a lot of the interviews that Backstage has done. So we'll link to that on backstage.com. And um, yeah, if you're just an actor starting out and and you're looking to have the kind of breakthrough that Emma Corrin has had, there's plenty to be gleaned here. So without further ado, let's get to it. Happy award season. Congratulations, Emma Corrin, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Stay tuned for the coming months, which I think are going to be very exciting. Hey, if you are an actor or an aspiring actor, someone at the beginning of your artistic career, and you haven't signed up for Backstage yet and you don't know how it works, I have good news for you. Backstage is offering 30 whole days completely free just for our In the Envelope listeners. If you visit backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code envelope, you will have full access to the site where you can make a profile, upload a headshot, upload a reel, start applying to the thousands of casting notices uploaded every single day on the world's number one casting platform. Again, we are giving listeners of this podcast 30 days completely free to try out Backstage. Go to checkout, that's backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code envelope if you want to be in contention for an emmy or for an oscar or for a tony or for a sag award do as many of the guests on this podcast have suggested and use backstage we are here for you again free 30-day trial backstage.com slash subscribe enter the code envelope Emma Corrin is best known as the breakout star of Peter Morgan's Netflix drama The Crown Season 4, cast in the daunting role of Lady Diana Spencer, the Princess of Wales. A University of Cambridge graduate who studied theatre across England, Emma has also appeared in the epic series Pennyworth and last year's Misbehaviour. Joining us from London, here is SAG and Golden Globe nominee Emma Corrin. Hi. Hi. <laughs> how are you? I'm very well. How are you? I'm pretty good. You're in London, you said. Yes, I'm in London. I'm in my little flat in London. Is this a full is this also a full day of press? Has it been nonstop press? You know what? It was for a bit. And then I had kind of two, three weeks where it really died down after the show came out. And it feels it feels interesting to start talking about it again. It was it's weird. I was on such like a, I guess when you're doing a lot of press, you you develop a kind of script and you develop a, you know, kind of way of talking about it. And now I've come back to it. It's it's interesting. I, I feel see. like I've forgotten. <laughs> well, that's actually yeah, that's probably good. Yeah, I want to yeah. make sure I want to have unscripted moments with you in this interview. <laughs> <laughs> And hear about hear about this stuff as if you know as if for the first time. But I do imagine there's a lot of a lot of talking about it. Congratulations on everything with the crown. Your work on the show is really really remarkable. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Because we are backstage, I'm going to ask you. We're all about crafting career advice, and so I'm going to ask mm-hmm. all kinds of. I'm so curious to know you know exactly how how this work was so wonderful. Um, and I know you've told this story many times, but we are also, of course, very interested in auditions. And this is, this must have been quite a big mm-hmm. audition process. Could you um, guide us through how that how that happened? Yeah, it was honestly, as you say, it was a big audition process. And also it happened at a stage where I was very early on in my career. So I was, you know, still mm-hmm. getting to grips with auditioning um, in the industry and what's that, what that's like and traversing all the challenges that um, come with that. Um, and obviously this role was known, you know, it, it, but when I first actually, well, it was sort of, it had, I had a very strange um, 
kind of audition process it kind of even wasn't really an audition process it was sort of a weird mm. um series of quite serendipitous events I suppose mm. basically the summer that I graduated from uni I was um pretty much steady audition auditioning in London and um I don't think I really had a place to stay yet I was sleeping on friends sofas and I was also working at a startup earning money and mm. um I remember my agent called me one day and she said we've um had a call from um, the casting directors of The Crown and they are in the process of casting season three and they have five girls who they are chemistry reading for Camilla um, with Josh O'Connor. But Peter Morgan has already written some scenes from series four between Camilla and Diana and they need someone to come and help out for the day. So mm. would you be, it's, it would be paid, it's just would you be able to come and just read off a script, not on camera, just to help them out? So I went along and did that but I remember talking to my agent about it and I think everyone in the casting well I guess agencies and actors of my age kind of knew that the part of Diana was going to come up and it would obviously be this huge thing um and I remember actually in my first meeting with my agent talking to her about it I think she asked me like what kind of would be your dream role and I said well I love the series like The Crown and I feel like uh-huh. those are such real and challenging roles and really interesting parts and we talked about how that might be a fit for me, but in a way that seems seemed very distant at the time and sort of a <laughs> kind of unreachable goal, but um, a good reference point, I suppose. So Maya, my agent said, you know, this is a great opportunity because essentially it's a non-pressure audition for you. Right. We know that you could be good for this. So all you can do in the situation is prepare if you feel like you want to. You're going to be in a room with incredible people, incredible creatives. Peter Morgan, the directors, the producers of The Crown, the producers of wow. Left Bank and at Netflix, and Nina Gold and Rob Stern. Um, and, you know, Nina Gold is, like, <laughs> casting director royalty here. Um, in the UK, I think my mm. agent, until that point, was kind of convinced she didn't exist. And, yeah, ah. so she said, this is a great opportunity. And um, so I did. I prepared a lot. I researched a bit, and I... Mm. Remember, I work. My mum's a speech therapist, and I work with her on the voice. Oh, cool! And um, just I, I learned the lines, and I remember that um, I had. I think I read with three of the Camillas, and then it was hmm. a lunch break. And I remember in the lunch break, um, the director took me outside and said, "Do you want to work on the character a bit?" And he said, "I love this vulnerability that you're bringing to her. That's spot on." Mm. But I think in this scene, it was a scene where Camilla and Diana have lunch, and he said, "I think." Mm-hmm. There's also a real strength to her, you know. She's not going to give up. She's not going to let Camilla walk all over her. And so let's find some of that strength. Mm. Um, so I went back in and did that with the notes. And then um, mm, okay. they asked if they could put me on tape. <laughs> and I remember um, being so kind of like excited by that. And then I remember after the I, after I'd helped out after that day, I called my agent. I said, oh, my God, I think they liked me. They put me on tape and they were asking, they were giving me notes. And I remember she said, Emma, you can't get excited about this. You know, I'm so glad that they seem uh. to have responded to what you did. But that's because you put time in and you prepared and they probably liked that. And it was probably useful f- right. for them to see someone bring this person to life. But she said, look, they haven't. They're so far from announcing cast, starting to cast for that role. Just forget about it. And it was very sage advice. And it was only about eight months later that they did officially start casting for it. And I was brought in to right. meet with Peter Morgan and Ben Karen. And I remember we had this incredible like couple of hours just in a boardroom talking about... I remember I had so much time to stew on it and kind of so much anticipation that for this, like if this moment was going to happen, that I had so many thoughts about her. And I think I'd read a lot in between those things and... Mm. We kind of just talked about her and what Peter was going to do with the series. And I then remember that he said, oh, I've heard this um, story that apparently she sang All I Ask of You for Charles for that anniversary from Phantom of the Opera. And I said, "Um, oh, my God, that's my favourite musical. And which wasn't untrue, but I definitely exaggerated. (laughs) And um, (laughs) and I remember Ah. him saying do you know, do you know the song? And I said, yeah, it's like my favourite song ever. And he was like, well, do you want to sing it now? And I remember it was kind of one of those moments. It took me back to that bit in Friends when Joey's like, of course you always lie on your CV. And then they say, can you ride a horse? And you have to just say yes. And I was kind of had this kind of like, I felt like I was on the (laughs) precipice kind of moment. And I kind of, I just said, yeah, sure. I mean, I'd sung in school. 
I was I was a good singer at school, but hadn't sung in ages, like years and years and years. So you're not a musical theater actress, no. I'm definitely not a musical. I was I sang in chorally. I did some like classical training at school, but apart from that, nothing. Yeah, and hadn't practiced for years. And so suddenly I was in this room and um, saying, yeah, sure. And Rob Stern, the casting director, got very excited. And he pulled up on YouTube a karaoke version. And he was like, right, Emma, oh my I'll sing the male part <laughs> and you'll sing the female part. And then Ben Karen got out this like um, camcorder, old camcorder. And they set me what? up by the window. And Ben said, just imagine I'm Charles, just sing it to me. And wow. I mean, I was like there and I was like, can I just have like a minute to look at the words? And I was literally the fastest I've had to memorise everything. And then I remember this moment where Peter tried to leave the room. And I don't remember this, but in retrospect, oh. Peter Morgan's told me that I, t- I saw him leaving the room and I said, what are you doing? Which I can't believe I said, because <laughs> I feel like I would. But oh, no. maybe in my panic I did. So I knew that I was flying by the seat of my pants. And apparently, he tells a story now, very anecdotally, and I'm like, I'm worried that this didn't happen. Is I there? He said, that, he said that he tried to leave the room, and I said, what are you doing? Where are you going? And he said, oh, I thought I'd leave you to it. And apparently, I said, not after you've made me do this. I said, you're not going Oh, my in. gosh. <laughs> um, and so, he stayed, and we kind of felt like a very group effort, and, and I did that. Right. And it felt very, like in the moment and I felt kind of flustered and I de- definitely didn't sound great and I felt very worried that I'd well, kind of dived head into something that wasn't going to pay off um but I think that was sure. uh, in retrospect apparently the directors have said who saw the tapes um I think Jess mm. Hobbs said that it was that that um made them think that I could manage the part which I have no idea where they got that from my bad <laughs> singing that's <is laughs> interesting sure. it's interesting and I think that whole process taught me a lot about seizing these little opportunities when you're starting mm. out. Yeah. You know, if you're asked to read for something, if you're asked to help out, you know, prepare, you might as well. You never know what's going to happen or the people you'll meet. Right. And I guess just... Um, and say yes. Yeah, say yes. And also I remember being in that meeting with Ben and Peter, and I think it was just credit to them as very... Um, laid back creatives without mm. any ego we could just kind of sit I didn't feel as intimidated as I thought I would and I think it's probably because we found so much common ground talking about Diana weirdly but it felt very I don't know I felt like I was able to suddenly kind of be objective to the experience and mm. to sit there and think say, think to myself oh I actually have ideas about this and I have mm. thoughts about this. And they seemed very interested to hear them, which was encouraging. And mm. so I owe them a lot for making me feel very um, at ease, I suppose. Yeah. It's a mix of high stakes because, of course, these are these these prominent people, as you said, yeah. but low stakes in the sense that they were also casual. And throwing you curveballs, I think, almost yeah. helps loosen things up a bit, right? Yeah. And I think what I found is that I don't know, there's like a balance you sh- need to strike with kind of just going with it sometimes in auditions. I think I had the tendency mm. to over-prepare and make sure that I was like so sealed up into this character previously that, mm. you know, they couldn't, there's no way they couldn't not like me for it because I felt like I ticked every box, the lines, the research, mm. the, you know, but I went into this room and it seemed so far out of my reach I, I felt like ah. there was I mean I had hardly any experience this was the biggest TV right. show in the part and the role that everyone was talking about and I felt like <laughs> it's gonna sound really stupid all I could go in there and do was <laughs> share a bit of what I thought and what I learned what I'd learned about her and I think maybe that helped I don't know what I'm trying right. to say but I guess for once I felt very unarmed and like mm. I don't know it meant that I think everything was organic in the room. I hadn't mm. over-prepared for anything. Right. right. You said, so you said in that you've almost felt objective at one point in the audition. I wonder if that's almost also like an element of a good uh, audition where you can be vulnerable is that you felt comfortable enough to look at the part in a way that wasn't ego-driven, right? Like in a way that wasn't, here's my subjective opinion because I desperately want it. It was more like what you said. Yeah. Of, I, I this is these are my ideas that I'm bringing to this role. Yeah, exactly. I think that 
because I'd got to know it before by helping out weirdly and then I had a lot of time to kind of percolate on it or let it is percolate the right word maybe um sure and then I'd kind of come back to it I felt like yeah. I don't know it felt familiar but mm. I didn't feel the same sense of desperation and yeah I didn't feel overwhelmed by it and I don't right. really know why it might have been just how Peter and Ben related to me in the room which was mm. on such equal even footing we kind of just sat around and just talked about her even footing and the series right. for a bit yeah right it's been said a lot about Peter Morgan he's a collaborator he's all about He's all about yeah. um, treating everyone, including his actors, as his fellow on equal footing collaborators. Yeah, exactly. I think that's very much that's very true, and it can make a huge difference in an audition when you sense you're there with someone who really genuinely cares about the work. And I think this is so mm. much what it comes down to is the work. Mm-hmm. And if you show that you're you care about it and you've thought about it, kind of in completely separately from the role Hmm. then I think the people you're in a room with really respond to that because obviously for most people it would be something they've been working on or have been developing for such a long time right well so take me back to the very beginning so you um you did you grow up with the dream of being an actor first of all um yeah I mean that's kind of the first thing I can really remember wanting to do I remember I wanted to be a marine biologist for a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. But um, when I was 10 years old, I remember I was in a school production of Wind in the Willows, I think it was. And a friend's mum mm-hmm. came up to me afterwards and said, oh, you were great. You should be an actor. And I think that something clicked. I don't know. <laughs> I don't really mm-hmm. remember it clicking, but it must have done because I never really from that moment wanted to do anything else. Aha. Um, uh-huh. Because we do like to ask on this podcast, if you were doing anything else... Or would you ever have a plan B? Have you ever had a plan B for your career? Not really. Not really. There was never, I don't think I ever allowed myself to. Not in any serious way. Because I think I realized or I knew that I needed to have a very singular focus. Mm -hmm. And I needed to have a drive in completely one direction. And if I let myself contemplate doing anything else... Yeah. I would maybe lose momentum. Mm-hmm. But I remember like from really like really tangibly like vividly remember from the ages of ages of about 16 17 just focusing any time or energy I had on thinking about how I could possibly make this a reality and it seemed mm. so unbelievably hard to the industry seemed very out of reach it seemed that like this kind sure. of other planet that you heard about the industry, like, and you had, you you know, the term breaking in, she's a breakout mm-hmm. star, they're a breakout mm-hmm. star, they've broken into the industry. And I mean, it's very interesting if you interrogate that language, it really speaks to how secretive and how sort of, um, sure. how hard it is, how alien yeah. the industry seems to up and coming actors. And I remember it's something that I talked to a lot of friends about at that stage. And we said, and I think my friends, um, Polly and Joan have done it a little bit with a platform that they made in the UK called the Monobox, mm-hmm. um, where they help young actors prepare for drama school, help them understand the lay of the land in between, you know, wanting to break in, I suppose, and then when you're on the other side of it. And that whole thing, they make it more accessible. And I think that's I so see. important. And I remember dreaming of something like that to help me understand how I would get to where I dreamt of. Yeah, that sounds crucial. The idea of just making it, as you say, less of a big, scary, intimidating industry. I'd never thought about the term break into or break in is almost violent. It almost requires like physical exertion. But that's kind of what it feels like, I think, for a lot of people. At least for me, it feels like I'm now on somehow maybe on the other side of things and it feels like I've kind of been running a marathon right and it's weird to hear from like my friends who I went to uni with saying when I talked to them about it and they said yeah but you basically shut yourself away for three years I had a very weird way of driving myself towards where I wanted to be when I was at university and Hmm. in retrospect it's 
was very I, did, I wasn't really aware of it at the time but um mm. I just remember ne- I was at Cambridge and there were a lot of opportunities to do student theatre there are a lot of plays that you could do and I just remember thinking I want to do as many as I can to maximize right. learning to maximize exposure to try and get as many agents to watch my stuff as possible um to try and just like put myself into the center of hopefully something that will get me somewhere and I remember that to do that I had to be really strict with myself so that I would go to bed at 10 p.m. every night, Mm. which meant that I hardly ever went out at uni. And I would wake up at 7 and I would go running and then I would do my work and then I would go to rehearsal and then I would just rehearse, 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 rehearse and Mm -hmm. try and fit in work around that. Um, Wow. And then I remember I would sneak away to London and try Uh and... I was working as a voiceover artist to try and earn money on the side. um, Okay. Which... I remember I wasn't allowed to do it at uni, but I managed to I managed to do anyway. <laughs> um, I see. Okay. Yeah. So in retrospect, it feels like I really, I don't know. Yeah. The term break in, it requires, I guess, a lot of effort, no matter. Sure. Yeah. I almost think that's good for our listeners to hear is like, it really requires this kind of single minded focus. Was the voiceover, was the voiceover work um, your way of making money on the side? So even your side gig was related to acting? Yeah, it kind of happened quite uh, accidentally. I, a friend of mine at university, his, his parents ran an um, hmm. ADR company called Sink or Swim. And uh, they do ADR, like crowd ADR for TV and film. Interesting. And um, sometimes they needed young students who could do accents or different voices. And I remember mm-hmm. they'd come to see a show me and him did together and asked if I wanted to come out and help. And it's good money and also it was good experience um, gotcha. because a lot of actors, um, especially jobbing theatre actors, do it on the side, I think, because mm-hmm. it pays really well. And um, it's very interesting work. And it was very interesting being on the other side, suddenly watching a lot of television and film from the ADR studio and right. learning how to do ADR and being in that kind of environment. I don't know in what ways it really helped me, but I know that it did. Mm-hmm. It kind of felt like I was dipping a toe in the water of something. Um, right. Well, that was sort of my other question was, was all of your studies in uni, that was all theater based, correct? Yeah. And so your introduction to, to what was the kind of transition? Was it a transition to screen work? What was that like? Um, I remember my first experience of that transition was probably when I started doing tapes Mm-hmm. my agent I got my agent okay. in the my last term of uni and I remember starting to do tapes and just getting very blunt realistic feedback which I really appreciated well right. I definitely appreciate now in retrospect and it just <laughs> was kind of a rude awakening to, to the fact that I could have done as many plays you know as I could at Cambridge but it wouldn't <laughs> it wasn't exactly going to help me become a screen actor because it's so different interesting I mean, you you are required to do so little, right? When you are on screen, I like uh, one twitch of your facial expression goes such a long way. And obviously, mm. in theatre, you are projecting every single muscle in your facial expression to the back of the <laughs> room, so everything needs to be larger than life. That is so interesting. This idea that it was the self tapes that taught you, and your agent, of course, helped. Um, yeah, massively. can I, we love hearing about self tapes, especially these days, because that's how everyone is auditioning. What in yeah. your mind, what is like, what is a good self tape? What are your, what is your advice for how to make a good one? Oh, it's a very interesting balance between not trying too hard and not being over the top. I think minimalism mm. in self tapes is always good. Okay. Hmm. And also being very prepared, but I think the preparation has to come very much behind the scenes in the work you do from the script on the script or on the Mm -hmm. scenes and what you've researched about um the people who are in the um on the production side of it what things they've done before what their taste is the director what they've done before you know for instance if you're gonna do a self-tape for um Luca Guadagnino Mm -hmm. that would probably require very different type Mm. of self-tape from if you're going to do a self-tape for Taika Waititi 
you know? Sure. It's two very sure. different styles. So you yeah, have, I think styles. putting in research to what kind of, yeah, style of self-tape um, is required of you is very important. I know it's something that my team, especially at the moment, are, I mean, have really, really instilled in me is, um, you know, do your work. So mm. if a project comes in before they even send me the script, they kind of won't, they kind of hold that ransom <laughs> and they'll say, oh. we've got this project coming in and they'll say, this is the director, this is the writer, these are the producers, go and watch their work. Do your homework. And then read the script. Ah, yeah. okay. Before reading the script. Right, 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 right. Okay. Yeah. So you have an idea in your head of what's going to be made. And then I think it will really helps in the kind of tone that your self-tape will take. The tone, um, okay. I suppose, if that makes sense. Or I guess the style of it. That's fascinating. Um, and I was once told, don't wear stripes. <laughs> and that's okay. always been in my head. I don't really <laughs> okay. know why. Of course, you mentioned uh, just this idea of preparation and even the, yeah. this, the research and the backstory and, the, and the, of course, watching the work of these other people. I mean, do you have a process that you do every time? Is this something you learned in, in uni as well? Um, it probably comes from uni, yeah. But I think it also comes in the fact that that's just how I work. I think because I'm a bit of a nerd, I love mm-hmm. being as informed as I can be about something. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, so doing a lot of um, preparation and research, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I do feel like, to bring it back to Diana, I feel like Diana is the perfect example of, talk about research and backstory. <laughs> yeah. I mean, her backstory is the stuff of history. You have lots and lots and lots. Was it an intimidating amount of material to dive into for research? It was. I found it very intimidating, but actually it was more the type of material material that I found intimidating. Mm. I found I found like I was very caught within common conceptions of who Diana was. Okay. And the fact that she was an icon and the fact that she was the people's princess and she was, you know, you could read tabloid stories and, mm. you know, comments on everything that she did or apparently what she was thinking or this or that. You know, there are biographies, hundreds of biographies Mm -hmm. written about her. And I kind of didn't feel like that got me any closer to really feeling like I had a foothold in anything that I could Mm. really portray, honestly. Yeah, I found there's one documentary called In Her Own Words, which is narrated by her. And to be honest, that was kind of the only thing (laughs) that I used apart from the research pack that the research team gave me which was very tailored to our scripts um okay in her own words gave me a sense of her voice of how she talked about things and her perspective Mm. as well as a very good summary of the events throughout the period which i would be portraying her Um, rather than other people's perceptions of her yeah i started a lot of biographies and then i just thought i feel like i'm reading a speculation and it wasn't really helpful to be honest the most helpful thing was getting the scripts through because then I was like oh okay this is kind of a blank slate this is Peter's created the character this is my character I'm gonna approach this how I would any other fictional character that I'm playing um well not any other but like any fictional character that I would be playing you know you bring your own you try and empathize you try and relate and you try and you bring your own bring yourself um yeah stuff to it I guess but it was incredibly was really cool. intimidating. I was, yeah. I'd also love to ask about the physicality and the, I want to say inside out versus outside in approach. Do you think of yourself as inside out or outside in maybe for this role? Probably inside out. Okay. Interesting. By what do you mean by inside out or outside well, in? I mean, how, I'm interpreting it as in like, I, or I think I absorb information Mm-hmm. And then I figure mm-hmm. out how I relate to it or empathize with it. Yes. In order to try and authentically feel those things when I'm portraying them. Right. Rather than rather than the wig, the makeup, and the clothes informing how you then feel. Yeah, right. no, I'm yeah, definitely inside out. <laughs> inside out. Yeah. 
Because I almost feel like for someone so well known, you of course have to think about how they look and that would require a little bit of outside in. But I also understand you spend hours in the makeup chair with, with these, with the hair. <laughs> and so you can't show up on set relying on being able to play Diana based on just a wig. I think I, for me, I think that the costumes and the makeup and the hair are incredibly important. But for me, they are the last things, obviously, that you do. So for yeah. me, they kind of seal me up. Like if I'm <laughs> like putting on a onesie that covers like a morph suit of character, like a character sure. morph suit. And if it was like a zip up one, they would like be the zip. <laughs> so they so would cool. kind of like seal it all together, seal all the other like juices in, I guess. <laughs> um, That's great. Yeah. I remember some of the most rewarding work I've done. I think maybe ever, um, was with Polly Bennett, who um, worked with Rami um, Malek on Bohemian Rhapsody, um, for Freddie Mercury, oh, okay. and she worked with me for Die. And I remember going to her studio in Bermondsey and us just lying on the floor for a very long time, trying to figure out how mm. we become this person. <laughs> who was so profoundly intimidating to try and understand. Sure. And I can't remember exactly how... I think we started with particular scenes from particular episodes, and I think we wrote down mm. what I wanted from the scene, what people wanted from me, and what happened. And I think we did oh, that okay. for a lot of the scenes. I guess actioning, which is something that I think, mm -hmm. you know, is... I guess the common term for it. And then we kind of traced a timeline through how, through the series, we were able to trace a timeline oh. of what Diana's wants and needs were compared to the wants and needs of others around her and how mm -hmm. those things interacted. Mm -hmm. We then worked a lot on um, movement and tried to... I was very aware that I... I think a lot of actors in the crown say this that you know you know you never want to mimic someone or just like do an impression of right. them. So it was really okay. important for me that I it was anything I replicated like her head tilt or her voice or hmm. the way she waved or the way she held herself was justified so I understood why she was doing it so that I could actually use it constructively within mm. the scenes rather than just like throwing it in because <laughs> I felt like I should. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was there a mirror work as well? Yeah. Well, doing it in front of the mirror. Yeah. I, I don't know how often uh, a tool that is for actors to use. I use that a bit on my own. I think I actually used that mm -hmm. more when I was auditioning than when I was um, actually interesting working on her with Polly. Because I suppose Polly's Polly became a mirror in a way. Right. We did a lot of um, <laughs> we we did a lot of work with like lasers. Um, I think I've mentioned this before in an interview, but um, mm -hmm. we trying to understand the pressure she was under. Mm. I guess at such a young age was a very interesting thing for us to explore, and the way we did it was I remember Polly would ask me to walk around the room. And then she's one day she was just like, okay, now imagine that from all around you, from really high up, beaming down on you are all these lasers, like you get in spy films when the person has mm -hmm. to cross, break, like is breaking into something and they have to get through the pointy lasers, <laughs> and they're beaming into you. And how does that make you feel? And what does that mm -hmm. make you want to do with your body? And I remember instinctively I bent my neck because I felt. Mm -hmm on the back of my neck and around me, all these lasers and the lasers were meant to be like the eyes of the public, the eyes of the Royal family, like mm -hmm. my internal demons and voices. And I remember they made me tilt my head or they made me kind of, I suppose what people would recognize as that like coy thing that Diana did. But for me, it was really helpful because then I had like a justification of why she was doing it. I don't right. know if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. And is it safe to say also like this idea of um, finding where you overlap with the character, again, more of an inside out approach. Were you thinking about this idea that you, <laughs> that there's a parallel where you are about to go through 
the reality that she went through of being kind of thrust into the spotlight? Like, was that something that you could almost relate to, I guess, preemptively? Yeah, I guess. It's really funny. I, when I was offered the part, I remember I spoke to Ben Karen, who was is one of the directors. Um, he directed, mm-hmm. uh, amongst others, he directed Fairy Toe, um, which is one of my favorite apps. And mm-hmm. he he, um, he said, he said, you realize um, you're gonna, your life's gonna change a lot. And any time, right. like you end up in the news or you know, you have people recognize you or you get photographers following you around. He said, use it because it's exactly like any of those emotions, the emotions surrounding that, like nervousness or excitement or fear or unease, unease, like that's all going to be what she was Mm. going through. And I remember this like insane moment where we were filming outside her flat in Earl's Court. And it's a scene where she's just being followed by photographers. But because it was very public we had all the photographers who were the supporting a- actors who were, you know, playing paparazzi. And then mm-hmm. beyond them, we had the actual paparazzi who turned up. No way. And it was oh a very gosh. strange... Yeah. The emotion that I felt when I was not being, like, just on set, waiting in my warm coat with a cup of tea and being photographed and having to be shielded by umbrellas... Mm. was exactly, I didn't need to change a thing about what I was feeling when I then went into, when they called action and I was being followed by these um, actors playing photographers. It was, it was really weird. wild. Yeah. History repeating it. You're, you are, you yourself are repeating history. Very weird. Very strange. The other thing you mentioned was this idea of um, the kind of the arc of, you're of course playing her over the course of a decade I almost want to ask, like, The Crown is so unique in so many ways. And of course, it's TV. But did you sort of think as each episode is a different feature film? I mean, you're, you're kind of working with different directors each each time. Is there um is there a difference between acting TV versus film for you? You know what? I haven't had as much experience doing film as TV. I I was in Misbehavior, mm-hmm. um, but only for I, I didn't I had a really tiny role. I think Blink and You Miss Me um, mm-hmm. <laughs> on screen. And um but so I'm not really sure, but I definitely think that some episodes to me felt like films, mm-hmm. and I think that's only because of the form of the episode itself. I think Fairy Tale episode three, Ben mm-hmm. and I spoke about as our little movie, and I think mm-hmm. that's because it reads without the rest of the series, as in if you released sure. that as a film, I think it would read. You know, it feels like it's very much Absolutely. Diana's internal. Mm-hmm monologue and it feels bookended with her experience Mm -hmm. yeah in a way that maybe the others don't I guess because it focuses solely on her internal world Mm -hmm. and when you're looking at that are you also thinking about where she will end up like do you are you thinking about charting an emotional arc and making sure that you're not I don't know, playing the ending at um, the beginning of the such, season. Yeah, that's so interesting. I'm so glad you said that, Jack. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, it was something that's really interesting. I remember it was something that Josh and I had to be really aware of, that we didn't play the ending. Right. But right. at the same time, you can't know we where We all know where it's going. Exactly. So <laughs> I think it just meant, to be honest, all it meant is that in the moments where we could, we tried to play them, I suppose, like... Happy. I guess it, the, the the biggest example mm. of this would be in Ep 6 when they're in Australia. And I remember yeah. being incredibly happy when I was doing some press a while ago and an interviewer said, there was this bit in episode six and they were just so happy and they were dancing. And for a moment, I totally forgot what happened. And she said, yeah. I was so, I just thought, oh my God, oh my God, it's going to work. They're going to be oh, fine. Yeah. And I was, Josh and I were so happy to hear that because I think that was all we could try and do. Yeah. is play it authentically but it's so hard when it's the most famously tragic ending to anything I suppose right um but to answer your previous yeah question about the arc it's really interesting because I was when I, a good example is I was filming episode three alongside mm. episode nine and ten no and, way okay yeah which I think if you'd have told me that or if I'd probably hadn't been so busy and I had time to digest it, would have scared the shit out of me. But yeah, it was, I actually found it really helpful. And I don't think in any like 
way that I sat down and thought about how it was helpful. I think in retrospect, I found it helpful because I had a constant awareness of where I'd gone with her, where I'd come from and where I was going. Mm. And the only bit that really caught me out was when I would walk from Ben's set onto Jess's set and Jess would say, for God's sake, Emma, posture. Because when, I mean, posture's awful anyway in real life, but um, I'm sitting up straight enough. <laughs> but um, for early, for young die, it's very like coy and shy and the head is bent and she, oh, okay. her posture is, she doesn't hold herself as well. And Jess and I had to really think about the distinction to like, how could I transform into this woman? especially when I'm playing someone older than my actual age. So, um, right. and a lot of that had to do with how she holds herself in the later episode, mm. especially when she mm. goes to New York and that kind of thing. And a lot of it was posture. So Jess would always get, she was like, God, I can tell you've been doing episode three because I'd come all, all hunched right. and shy. That's so interesting. But I found it useful. I found it really useful to think about what parts of her were still the young girl and what parts of her were evolving into a woman. Yeah. Well, I think that's almost what I, like, I as a viewer got the most out of your performance is this idea that she is definitely both a girl and a woman. And to see the, to see one diminish and one grow was, was so interesting. And it is wild. It is wild to think that you were filming them all at the same time. <laughs> but I think that's probably why maybe you felt that. I don't know. I'm really glad that you felt that. Mm. For me, it's like young Di and older Di are two people within the same person, but they are both very much there. Right. And I almost think of it as such a weird example, but I still have my teddy bear from when I was a little girl. (laughs) And sometimes, I mean, for the most part, I mean, I'm an adult, I don't really think about my teddy bear, but sometimes I'll (laughs) realise that I still have it and be like, and there's that, yeah, and I think I was thinking about this the other day and I was like, why do I have it? And also, is it because, and it was very strange because I certainly feel this way about that particular thing that is very childish. All my emotions around it mm. are ones of childish mm. attachment and childish significance. Mm. And when I recognise them and think about them within myself now, I definitely still can acknowledge mm. that child within me. I don't know if anyone else would be able to feel the same about anything maybe I'm just talking bollocks but I just think it's interesting and I think that for older Diana that was yeah probably a thing I think that maybe she kind of froze a bit in time when she was taken out of her yeah like life with her peers and her flatmates which was yeah she doesn't want to let that go no yeah yeah it's sort of like um she's Diana Spencer and then she's Princess of Wales, and those are two different people, and they are the same person. I think it's really interesting that on my, on the casting call, on my script, on my trailer, mm. on whatever, it was always mm. Diana Spencer. It was never Princess mm. of Wales. Yeah. Okay. Which I thought about a lot at the time. I was like, it's really interesting that they've identified that. That is the person I'm playing. I'm not playing Diana, Princess of Wales. I'm playing Diana Spencer. Yes. She's not a title. She's a person. Yes. Wow. Love yeah. that. Diana Spencer. <laughs> she's, a, she's a person, not a title. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Emma, this is so cool. Thank you so much for taking us inside this process. Um, I have to let you go soon. Can I ask you some very nerdy actually questions? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I like to ask, this is a very big question, but what is great acting to you? Like, what is it that you define as great acting you yourself or in other performances? That's so, so, that's such a good question. I'm trying to take this local because otherwise I'm going to get so overwhelmed by the question. So something good I've seen recently that I thought was great acting. Mm -hmm. Um, That's such a good question. I think the good acting is (laughs) conviction and vulnerability. I think that Mm. these are the words that are coming to my head. I don't know if they're going to make any sense. I, Mm -hmm. when I watch a film... And I know I'm seeing good acting when I feel completely and utterly convinced mm-hmm. by a portray- someone's portrayal to the extent that I feel utterly vulnerable and exposed to their performance. Mm. And, that, and therefore I leave as a viewer feeling profoundly affected. Mm. Exposed. Exposed. Yeah. I feel like 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel, feel I, I don't know if I can define it in any other way than what I feel when I'm watching it, I suppose, which is that all bets are off <laughs> and I don't know where they're going to mm-hmm. take me. And But I know that I'm going to leave witnessing this f- film feeling mm-hmm. changed or feeling moved in quite a profound yeah. way. Um, and also I think great acting for me is so often... But obviously, this obviously depends on genre and style of a piece. But acting that tends to affect me the most is very um, intimate, very character driven, very um, Mm. nuanced portrayals, almost sort of that it's acting, not even acting at all. Okay, that was beautiful. No, yeah, I think that echoes a lot of what you were saying about um, even just your crown audition of um, they connected to your vulnerability. And again, that's more of an inside out approach. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's, uh, I guess it's, yeah. Inside. Everything's inside out for me. <laughs> <laughs> which is, which is good that you know that. I mean, that's. In life and in art. It's not that you're going to, you can't approach every role the way you did Diana, but that is enough of a guideline to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a favorite actor? I have a lot of favorite actors. Mm-hmm. And I mean, growing up, it was Helena Bonham Carter. <gasps> no way yeah i mean i <laughs> that's wonderful i watched um a room of the view on repeat i think mm-hmm. and i just that's a good one yeah it's a good one that was really really like changed something in me and i was like wow i really want to i don't know i think something in her character really spoke to me and mm-hmm. i think the way that she throws herself into roles with complete conviction right is just and for like fun and it's she's just brilliant um and I think weirdly actually getting to know her now we have very similar processes of of getting to know Mm. getting into roles which is interesting in retrospect um Mm -hmm. I recently went to Venice and watched um I was at the film festivals here and I watched um Pieces Mm. of a Woman and Vanessa Kirby's performance and that is one of the most breathtaking performances I think I've seen in a in a long long time Mm -hmm. um and I remember she she in the too. in this in the film has a real time birth scene which they f- filmed in mm. one take, mm-hmm. and it is honestly I mean, incre- incredible. And the, her whole emotional journey on that is so visceral. You feel you're with her through every single mm. wave of anything that she feels throughout that. And I I thought that was incredible acting. I've um, watched a lot of Celine Siama's work this year. Mm-hmm. And there's an actress that she's used in a film called Water Lilies that I was really affected by. And also Portrait of a Lady of Fire. I'm worried I'm going to pronounce her surname wrong. Adele Hanel? Right. From, um, yeah, I've seen Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Yeah. yeah. And I think she's just a phenomenal actor. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and also, like, I've been listening... To, I watched um, I May Destroy You, and I've been listening to a lot of... Um, Michaela yes. Cole's interviews. I, yes. listened, I listened to the podcast she did with Louis Theroux and I could just, just listen to them talk all day. I think her mm. perspective on her work and on um, mm. the topics that she writes about and what she's motivated by are so interesting. Mm. Yeah. That's a great one too. Um, this is maybe more of a silly question, but do you have a worst audition horror story? <laughs> um. I really don't. I wish I did. Or maybe I do, but I've just blacked out from my memory. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Having to sing Phantom of the Opera on the spot. I mean, that's could, pretty could bad. Count. I remember mm-hmm. once I went into a theatre audition, and I'm not going to say who it was or what it was for, sure. but I went into a theatre audition. And I remember the guy who auditioned me was so enthusiastic. And honestly, being in a room with him talking about the role, it was so, it was like a, like, like a hype thing. It was like we just bouncing off each other and there was so much excitement and so much energy and we were just like chatting non-stop about the role and so exciting and I left feeling completely elated like I just got off a roller coaster of excitement and possibility and I walked out and I called my agent and I said oh my god that was incredible I honestly my I never say this but I think that went so well like um, not to say I not to say I've got it, but like wow, that was like we just really connected. And she said, "I've just got a call, and you didn't get the part." 
<laughs> oh, no, and it was genuinely knew. in a matter of minutes. I oh, think no. I honestly, I think I'd walked her about fifteen minutes before I called her, but it was in that time, and oh, it was like so the horrible. biggest one eighty that I've ever experienced in my life. I almost that is thought, a horror story. I almost thought that I walked into the wrong audition. I felt like, how can I have been <laughs> so like misguided? And just it was a great lesson. So not on the same page. In yeah. Just, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, last question. Uh, if you could give yourself one piece of advice, maybe your younger self, what would that be? What do you wish you'd known? Um, I have spent the last year and a bit trying to get consciously get better at understanding that I can say no and getting better at saying no. Mm. I'm very, mm. I'm naturally a people pleaser and... Mm-hmm. Especially, I think it will be this case for a lot of young people, especially young women in the industry, you often feel Mm -hmm. like, I think you often don't recognise your own worth in situations and it also feels so much like you should pander to anyone who is more experienced or more Mm. um, power than you, that you end up saying yes or Mm -hmm. putting yourself in a vulnerable position in something you don't want to do naturally I'm very bad at conflict and very conflict averse and I naturally Mm -hmm. like to please people so it's been but because of what the last year has thrown at me in terms of I suppose the crown and it's now being released and a lot of press and a lot of shoots and I suppose a lot of different situations I found myself in I've had to very quickly learn what it is that I where my boundaries are in terms of what I can I do feel comfortable in doing and what I don't feel comfortable in doing Mm. and Wonderful. Having the confidence to say no. And I think that if I would have, I wish my like 17 year old, 18 year old self would have known that to, yeah, to know that it's okay to say no and to not do things sometimes. It's okay to disagree and it's okay to let people down occasionally. Um, yeah. That's wonderful advice. Really. That's, that's so spot on. I, I, <laughs> I need to hear that too. So thank it's you. It's hard though. I mean, God, it's, and I may mean, still struggle Absolutely. with it on a daily basis. Um, yeah. I think that is ultimately what actors, as you say, especially actors need to hear to feel empowered, to say yes to certain things and no to others. Yeah. And also to like, yeah, don't let the industry or anyone walk all over you to the extent that you forget yeah. that you are you have power, you are important, you are worth a lot. Um, and don't be, let yourself, let that be, mm. let your self-worth be dictated by the industry's very twisted standards of yeah, yeah, things. Yeah. I don't know. Wonderful. Gosh, Emma, thank you so much. This is so great. Oh, thank you so much. It's been such a nice, I love, it's so relaxing. I don't know why. Oh, good. Yeah. No, this is really fun. And I do think that, um, you offer such a unique perspective. I think listeners are going to get a lot out of this. Mm-hmm. So thank you. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. And now it's time to hear from Christine McKenna Torella, our backstage casting insider. I will let her take it away. Hi, guys. Christine McKenna Torella here. This week to celebrate Emma's episode, I thought I would highlight the depth of backstage articles we have on auditions and advice for successful actors. This week's theme is The Crown. So if you're obsessed with the show or you just love to geek out about all the different creative aspects of a show, I've pulled a few interesting facts and quotes from our recent interviews with the creative team and actors. Lots of excellent content to dive into. I have always marveled at the characterizations each season. And during a backstage interview, Erin Doherty, who plays Princess Anne, revealed some insight into her preparation. She said, When I went up for Princess Anne, I watched a clip of her on repeat, and I ordered coffee in her voice. I had to try to embody her before going into a room and attempting to be her. Basically, I took her for a walk. That's how I put it. I needed to put her out in public before I could put her in a room with a casting director. I'm equally as fascinated about what decisions are made on how the story gets told. And we've interviewed Adriano Goldman, who's the cinematographer for The Crown, about evolving each season. He said, 
the philosophy is less is more. We want to be absolutely sure that every shot looks and feels like a dedicated shot. You question yourself every time you start a season. Do I still have the same motivation about this? But then we had a different cast from season three to season four, so it didn't feel like a continuation. Periods changed, so we had to change the look. Now on season four, we've embraced a modern design and architecture. It's not necessarily a conscious decision. We all just want it to evolve. There are decisions like, should we frame Olivia in a different way than we framed Claire? These discussions always come up. We don't say, this is what we're going to do differently in season four. The show is evolving naturally, becoming a little less classical and a little more observational and modern. We also have two excellent interviews. One is with Jessica Hobb, who directed part of the last season, and an interview with Nina Gold on what to expect when you're in her audition room, who casts the show. And I, my favorite fact about Emma being Princess Diana is that she was a reader in Nina's room the season previous. And that is how she got her audition for Princess Diana. Just last month, we interviewed Emerald Fennell, or Fennel, <laughs> not once but twice, because she plays Camilla Parker Bowles in the last season of The Crown, and she is the director of the amazing, promising young woman starring Carey Mulligan. Emerald is part of the reason I wanted to share these articles with you today, right? Because I admire her artistic vision and drive as both a director and an actor. As soon as The Crown was announced, way back before the public knew what they'd be covering, she reached out to her agent and she said, I, I am Camilla Parker Bowles, right? I am a young Camilla Parker Bowles and I should be seen for that role. Then she researched it. She followed the show. She eventually got the audition and of course she got the job. When it comes to being authentic in the audition room, she said, I would say, whatever the thing is, whatever the reason is you got into this, whatever it is that make you want to, want to do this stuff, that is the thing that makes you unique and it puts you in the position to be able to make this thing and only you can do it. Erin Doherty, to return to her article for one moment, also had great advice about rejection. Our job is predominantly to audition. You go up for more things than you get. That's just a fact. So you'll always be in that not knowing headspace. Take the pressure off yourself and just enjoy. Sink your teeth into whatever you love about it and don't worry about other people's opinions. Head over to backstage.com forward slash magazine and you'll find that there is a tag of The Crown Netflix. You'll see all the articles I've just mentioned and more. It's a wealth of information. On to the casting highlights of this week. There is a high paying digital commercial for Rogaine. They're looking for males of a variety of ages that need to use the product for an upcoming commercial. So if you think you fit the bill, take a look. A major US network is casting a pilot on backstage right now, seeking a series regular. They're looking for a male identifying boy from nine to 12 years old and must speak fluent or conversational Russian. That's a nationwide casting and they're seeking tips. So take a look if you know someone or you yourself fit that bill. Also, there is a production company seeking talent for a digital and social e-commerce campaign for Valentine's for Stella Artois. It's shooting in New York. Details on the site. That's all from me. Break a leg in your upcoming auditions and have a beautiful week. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.